Jonathan, here we are um, just after the first previews of Beautiful Thing at the Exchange. I suppose the first thing I should ask you is how is it going? Well, we've just done the, our first few previews of Beautiful Thing and at the moment it's going really well actually. I'm really glad that we've got quite a few previews before press night because although the actors are great, they're still sort of finding their feet and um, I think with this play particularly, because it is a comedy, although it's got a serious sort of message at its heart, there are certain bits that should be played for laughs. So when you, it's one thing rehearsing something in a rehearsal room and nobody laughing, but when you then get into the theatre space, it's like the audience then become the sixth character. So they, it's good to have the run up to press night where they can just judge what this other character's like and when, when are they going to guffaw, when are they going to snigger, or when are they going to be deadly silent um, and, and sort of in, incorporate that into the play, if you like. It must be quite exciting. This is the first major revival, I think, for five years, something yeah. like that and the first time it's been done in the round. Tell us a little bit about, about that kind of, yeah. that dimension, if you like. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm really excited to be here at the Exchange because, I mean, the last time the play was revived and I was involved was about six years ago in London, um, and, and that went really well. But then I, just the last few years I'd seen, I'd, I'd, do a, I'd sanctioned a lot of productions and it had been on a lot and it had been touring, and, and I'd pick up the odd review and I'd think, oh, I don't, that doesn't sound like my play, or they were, there was a bit of casting I wouldn't approve of and things like this. So uh, I stopped letting people perform it for a couple of years because uh, I wanted my other, to maybe take an interest in my other plays. So, uh, but when my agent phoned and said, it's the Royal Exchange and it's Sarah Frankham, I was sort of squealed with joy and said, of course, of course. So, uh, so it's really exciting. It's, and it's, I've always, I'm from Liverpool and it was a re always a real treat when I was a teenager to get on the train and come to the Royal Exchange and see a play. Um, it just felt quite glamorous compared to the theatres in Liverpool <laughs> because of the building. Um, and of course, I keep forgetting, but this is the first time it's been done in the round, um, which has its own problems and challenges, I suppose. Um, ha having said that, because Sarah's so used to directing here and Liz is so used to designing here, I, at no point while I've been watching it have I thought, oh, this is the first time it's been done in the round. It sort of almost feels like it was written for this space, you know, so that just hasn't become the issue I thought it might have done. I, I remember thinking, oh, it's going to be interesting to see how they, how they pull it off, but it hasn't even crossed my mind when I've been watching it, so that's been good. Do you think, um, do you think that it's actually added anything, being in the round? I don't know if it's added anything. I think all I know is it's such a beautiful space. It's, I suppose that adds something. That's, it, it feels special to me, the Royal Exchange. It's, it's the next, because you can see audience all the time. You know, you can see, you, you, it's a real communal experience. You know, I watch television a lot on my own, but when I go to the theater, I'm part of a group of people. And, and if you're all sitting facing the same way, you're not, not often connecting with them. But so to be able to, I don't know, there's something, there's also something quite voyeuristic about it because it's such an intimate play in lots of ways and there's lots of private moments between people and taking their first steps when they're falling in love and that sort of thing. To then have this whole crowd of people staring in, it's, it's, that certainly adds something, yes. Now, we can hear in the background <laughs> that music plays a huge part in, 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 this, in this play and indeed in this production. Um, Mama Cass, um, an obsession of yours? Where, where, where's that reference come from? Well... I was a bit young for Mama Cass, but my mum and my auntie used to talk about her. My auntie was quite, let's say, big boned. And uh, I think her nickname might have been Mama Cass, I'm not sure. But the fam there, was, there was always the family story that Mama Cass had died choking on a sandwich. Now, I don't think that was actually true, but it's certainly the urban myth. Um, so I was aware of who she was. And then when I was writing the play back in 1992, I uh, just came across um, a cassette, because we had cassettes in those days, of Mama Cass's Greatest Hits, and I bought it just to see what it sounded like, because I'd heard of her, um, and started listening. And I, I always work in silence, but um, if I put something on in the interim, it was Mama Cass. And I'd, uh, listening more and more to the lyrics, they just really seemed to chime with the themes of the play, and it was almost like she was talking to Jamie in the play. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're very sort of life-affirming lyrics, and they're very much about celebrating being a bit different and not giving a damn. Um, and her voice is very pure and, and sweet. So, uh, yeah, it's. I'm really glad I chose the Mama Cass music because if I'd chosen like the Nolan Sisters or something, it would just you know. Can you imagine being in this building today and hearing "I'm in the mood"? I don't think it would have stood the test of time. So uh, yes, it was quite it was quite a, a smart move on my behalf. And I didn't want to have really obvious music like the music of the day and what kids would really be into. Um, I want I wanted there's something to be sort of timeless about it, I suppose. So you were talking about when you first wrote, wrote the yeah. play in, in 1992. Now, uh, I guess at the, the, that time, um, the 
government were debating the age of gay consent, there was a lot of positive legislative, legislative change in relation to rights of gay people, what has happened since the play. Yeah. Um, do you feel, how, how do you feel it's changed since you wrote it? I mean, do you think it's changed for the better? Yes, I think when I wrote the play, I mean, part of the reason I wrote the play was because the age of consent law was being debated a lot. And whenever I turned on the TV and, and listened to the news, it was um, it was always very posh blokes in the House of Lords debating homosexuality, and it was they all seemed to want to, all they wanted to talk about was as they called it buggery and sodomy, and uh, and it just it just didn't bear any relation to my experience as a gay person growing up, um, which for me was about emotions and falling in love and um, being different and having to. Conf- confront things and having to tell your family and you know it, was, it felt like a bigger deal than, than what they were just sort of reducing it to the act of anal sex um, and the law was you had to be 21 in this country to be a gay man and to have consenting sex I suppose um, but you had to be 16 as a straight man or straight woman there was no law for lesbians because Queen Victoria had brought the law and didn't believe they existed I don't think they do actually either <laughs> Um, and so my, I wanted to write a story in which the two protagonists were under the age of consent, so I wanted them to be sort of 15, uh, and for it not to be about sex, but about two boys falling in love and, um, what, and the journey that they go on, to just show a different side to what's, what I felt was being said. Now, since then, obviously, the age of consent is now equalised, and, and the, right, the legisl- legislative rights for gay people in this country are a lot better than 20 years ago. Um, that doesn't take away homophobia, there's still hate crimes going on, so it's, it, homophobia is still there, but legally the, the country's changed really, come on in leaps and bounds. It's interesting, yeah. I mean at the time, I suppose, so-called gay plays, a lot of the plays that were around at the time when you wrote Beautiful Thing, were quite angry plays, yeah. of, of deaths, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. this is not an angry play, is no. it? It's, it's a very, it kind of presumably stood out for that, for that kind of reason, I, think, I suppose. I think so, I'm, I'm often the last person to ask about why something of mine is successful, because I don't know, because I just sat on my bed and wrote it in a couple of weeks. Um, but I think it came, it, historically, it's sort of looking back, it came at a time when most gay drama was very um, angst-ridden, and, and rightly so, because it was 92, 93, AIDS, uh, the pandemic of AIDS had hit this country, and people were responding, dramatists were responding to that. And, you know, I remember going to see Angels in America in 1992, and it still, it remains to this day the best play I've ever seen. It really challenged me, it did, and it was life-changing for me. And it, it inspired me to write Beautiful Thing, actually, but my natural bent, <laughs> want of a better word, is, is the comedic and a, a likeness of touch and and because I wanted to write a story with a happy ending and, and a bit of a rosy glow about it it did then feel very different because although AIDS is mentioned in the play it's not a play about uh, AIDS it was it was a play about coming out so it was just it was probably just a little bit of fresh air after um, some rather heavyweight stuff does it does it worry you that, it, that in some ways it, this play is still seen as a gay play and you're a gay writer I mean it's a play with universal themes about relationships, growing up, falling in love. I mean, does it worry you that people still it, label it in that way? It does. I've never, I've never been frightened of being called a gay writer because at least I'm being called something. <laughs> and maybe being gay helped my writing stand out from ten other scripts on somebody's pile. So I think it's only done my career and, and my life good. So therefore I don't mind it being called a gay play. I think it's more than that. But it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather it was called a gay play than a crap play. So uh, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> because it, really, when, when you wrote it, I mean, it catapulted you into... I mean, I thought you were a teacher before you... I was a comprehensive school yeah. teacher. And so suddenly there was this, this incredible attention. I mean, it must have had something that a lot of other plays at the time didn't have. We talked about something of that. Yeah. But what, is, in essence, do you think it, it, it kind of... And still does. Why does it still grab audiences? I think... I... And be honest here, I mean, you know. I think the success of the play lies in its sense of humour. It entertains. Um, so it can still pack its punch with the story, but it's, it's ostensibly a comedy. So it's got this window dressing of humour. Um, but I think the reason it succeeds is not just because it's, it's a quite truthful story about coming out. I think it's because when the two boys are in the bed together, having a sleepover, 
um, you know that one of them fancies the other one and should they make a move. I think we can all relate to that, no matter what our sexuality is. And that mates of mine who went to see it who weren't gay were, were just enraptured by those scenes, I think. And then, God, it just really brought back to me what it was like to be 15 and, you know, you've got this whole scary world out there and, uh, and, and, what, and what do you do if you fancy somebody? And I think that, for me, that's, that seems to be the key to it, that everybody can relate to uh, those first feelings and, and what do you do about them and how scary and exciting they can be. Uh, so I think that's it, really. And I think, coming around, sort of, to talk about this production again, um, Tell me a little bit about what you think of the cast and, and, and the way it's kind of evolved. And, and it must be quite, quite an interesting experience to come and see your play this many years on from the first production. And how has it changed, perhaps, from when you first saw it in, on stage? It's hard to say how, how the how productions have changed over the years. I don't think they really have. I mean, what I really like about this is that they've rooted it in 1993. I've seen productions since, like there was one at the Bolton Octagon a few years ago where they had brought us up to date and uh, it opened with a sort of shameless style um, uh, film with Jamie going, hi, my name's Jamie and I live in the such and such, it reset in Manchester. Um, and of course it was exciting and it meant it was very easy to access for young people, which was great. Um, but this production is very, very uh, faithful to its, to its origins, I suppose. Um, I don't know, it's interesting, I just, what, what's interesting for me is I was 24 when I wrote it, I'm 43 now, and um, Sandra felt like, a, you know, an old lady's character in those days, and now of course uh, Claire Louise is playing as, like, at least 10 years younger than me, <laughs> so, <laughs> things like that I find a bit slightly worrying. Um, I think it's a challenge to cast because you have uh, three parts, three su really substantial parts on that stage who are playing 15, 16, so it's always best to aim low with that age group, but then you're taking a risk because you're putting your marvellous words in the hands of um, relatively inexperienced people, you know. Um, so it's always, it's the casting process for this play is always interesting. And, you know, all I can say about this cast is that they've picked the best of the bunch, really. So um, there'd be nothing worse than sitting in the audience and not, not feeling it's safe in somebody's hands. And I think that can be, that's easy to achieve with, or easy to get wrong with, um, child actors or people playing kids um, but with this fortunately there's a, there's a good balance of the, the grown ups being good and the kids being good so uh, yeah I think you know Sandra's, uh, Sandra's always been my favourite character in the play because she gets the big one liners and things like that and she's, she's a dirty cow basically and, uh, and I think Claire Louise has certainly managed to <laughs> give us the dirty cow quotient and the audiences seem to, to love it when the dirtier is they I've been watching it, I thought, gosh, it's like a precursor for Linda and Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. I've never really noticed that before. <laughs> Another thing I wrote. So uh, that, that struck me last night. But uh, no, it's... I don't want to go on about any, any one of them individually because it's sort of invidious, isn't it, to say? It makes it sound like Claire Louise is better than the rest, which she's not. But um, no, it's, a, it's a, real a really good company. And of course, uh, Sarah Frankham, the director, um, has, has been saying all along that you know she remembers one of the very first previews of one of the, mm. the very first production and it being one of the most exhilarating nights of her life. She remembers it, um, you know, uh, mm. absolutely with with fondness and, and mm. clarity. We're a couple of days away now from three days away now from our press night here. Mm. Do you think the play still has that power to kind of send people out into the night, sort of singing and dancing, or feeling that power and that kind of affirmation? I, I, I would like to think it's still got that power, and I think it's our job now to make sure it's got that power, and and because that's the response I want from audiences. So that's the work we've got to do now to ensure that the audiences have a great time. They're in for a good night. It's a, you know, it's a decent play. It's a really good production and it's nice and short so you don't get a square arse. It's good. So it ticks all the boxes for me. And the, you know, the interval's never that far away. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. Cheers. <laughs>